cooking is a great source of consolation to me, but the serious question you put to me, cooking. I would be the one, cooking is wonderful, yeah. I love cooking, yeah, it Why? is. Something I can do. I was always very bad at woodwork, the things you had to do at school. I sort of didn't draw very well. I'm okay at drawing, but not very good. Um, music, I was hopeless at playing music, played clarinet incredibly badly. And all these hand tactile manual things, I have no idea how to fix a car, not a clue. Um, when I stopped being kosher, I discovered what real food tasted like. And I bought my first cookery books. Uh, when did Dave's you stop being kosher? Very late, after I'd stopped believing in the Jewish God. I mean, not till I was about 16, I think, really. <laughs> I, I, was, I was more worried about my the mother. Messiah behind the Messiah and didn't cooking. matter. <laughs> my mother mattered there. But, but, um, but I left both my mother and the Messiah behind and started cooking. Yeah. Yeah. I went through every kind of forbidden food in the week, you know, shrimp, lobster, everything I could afford, you know. It was all wonderful, you know, absolutely fantastic. Still is wonderful. And I bought my first cookery book, and I discovered, lo and behold, that. Um, you needed a palette and you needed a watch timing, some form of timing. Yeah. And you needed to know the difference between a hard, a, s a soft simmer, and you, you know, what a saute, or just the basic. There was a great book, actually, I say Elizabeth David, that was the first serious book, but before Elizabeth David, it was a wonderful book for, for idiot men by Len Dayton, a mystery writer, called Oué le Garlic. <laughs> Not even oué lai, but oué le garlic. And it simply told you how to chop stuff, actually, and you know what a garlic was. And when to, this was a fantastic world to me. And um, I, I fell in love with cooking then, and, and I've, I've, I've always been. It's huge. It's, it's something that I can make happen, and it's something that has you know, tremendous sort of sensuous richness to it. And um, I love doing it. I just love doing it. Um, now, would it have been a consolation for my dying friend? Absolutely not. But it would have been in the sense of uh, it, cooking is a huge distraction. You are in another world. You just have to attend to things while you're cooking, really. <laughs> Een man die van koken en braden houdt, omdat hij dan even verlost lijkt van deze wereld, is de rits in Londen binnengestormd. Eén bonk nervositeit. Problemen met uitgevers. Ik weet niet of het wat wordt vandaag. Als ik ergens niet aan denk, is het dan schoonheid en troost. Kan ik deze telefoon even gebruiken? Het was zijn voorstel om te filmen in de rits. Een rustige omgeving met een rustig uitzicht op een rustig groen park. Hoe moet je hem omschrijven? Kleinzoon van Pools-Joodse voorouders. De kunstkenner die meer van Rembrandt weet dan Rembrandt zelf. De historicus die meer feiten lijkt te kennen dan de wereld heeft voortgebracht. De historicus die vooral troost lijkt te vinden in een verleden dat hij nooit meemaakte. Een liefhebber van kerkhoven en associaties. 
We begonnen de dag met de definitie van geschiedschrijving. You capture a moment of lost life, really. Um, you capture a moment of lost life. A fugitive life, of life which you know is going, has gone. Um, and you, you, re, you, you try and have the power, again, very Olympian task, of making it come to life again. You, you provide the illusion that it's alive again. Yeah. That's what I try and do. That's what you were doing when you were a kid. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Did yeah. you realize what you were doing? Well, what I wrote, a, I wrote a play about, which, which again I've never talked about, when I was seven years old. <laughs> this is certainly a, a, a recompense for the loss of empire. It's comical. I wrote a play for my three friends who uh, live next door, Ingrid and John and Gordon. <laughs> and it was about Sir Francis Drake. Um, I'd grown up, I guess, on all these uh, terrible Alexander history costume movies, yeah. which were made during the war, and about which Gore Vidal writes very, very wittily, um, which are all made when the Brits invaded and kind of colonized Hollywood in an attempt to force the Americans to think of this as a common war of freedom against despotism, which, damn it, it was. But Vidal is very funny about the way in which fires over England and all these Alexander Corda films were made. Um, and I'd grown up on them, so I was very into, you know, the world of the first Elizabeth of Elizabeth I. I wrote this little play about Sir Francis Drake um, uh, and the raid on Cadiz, in which um, it was said in the history book I read that Sir Francis Drake had singed the King of Spain's beard. And I assumed this was entirely literal, that he'd actually somehow got to the king and had set his beard on fire. <laughs> so this is why I wrote my little play for several parts, <laughs> including, because I sure as hell wasn't going to do it, I was the directorial hand, a fake beard made out of cotton wool for my friend Gordon. He was the youngest brother. <laughs> he was the one who couldn't, which we then set alight <laughs> to the horror of his mother. <laughs> actually had to cope. We then put it out in time to prevent <laughs> serious third degree burn. <laughs> but this was, um, yeah, this was my first attempt to write history. The second attempt was to do a write a history of the Royal Navy, which I did entirely in cigarette cards. Did you have those in, in Holland? Yeah, we the war? yeah. Okay, never had them in America. So some of them were all to do with there are the great cricketers, but there was a series of great battleships of Britain. And so I did this as well. This was my second history book. So it was transparently about, you know, consolation for the loss of any sort of serious power in the world, I think. But if we talk about beauty and consolation, right. does the Jewish part of your upbringing come in, really, or is that the first no. association you make? Um, because I'm with beauty and somewhat, consolation, no, um, no, I wouldn't say so. Um, Kipling. Um, well, yeah, yes, I, w I wouldn't say. Uh, well, yes, actually, yes, they're, they're um, um, yes, as with all your conversations, <laughs> pro wonderfully provoke one to think the things that hadn't quite made sense. Yes, I mean, uh, um, growing up with with. Kipling and Churchill, for example, with whom yeah. I begin my new project about British history. Um, there was certainly a sense, actually, of becoming immersed in the richness, and I would say the beauty, as well as the, you know, there's much ugliness in the British past, um, as a way of, um, as a consolation, yes, for, 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 the, for the loss of grandeur, I would say. I mean, little boys want to grow up yeah, certainly my generation, little boys did, I think, really. Um, not having the sense that the kind of grandiose chapter in British life, even perhaps British imperial life, um, was gone. But it was absolutely and utterly gone, mm -hmm. really. Um, and certainly the kind of exploration of the fabric of the past, really, its furniture in the sense in which Macaulay used that word, um, its clothes, its diction, um, its uh, um, manners of speech, its customs, um, all that did seem to me, certainly um, as, a, as a kid, um, in, uh, in the 50s, uh, to be more beautiful, yes, actually, I would say that, um, and more compelling. Um, 
more an object of desire and reflection, a place I wanted to be much more than a kind of grim, grey, um, culturally impoverished, rather miserable world, actually, of British reality in the early 50s. So I think that's true, coronation or not, no coronation. So I think there was something really yeah, a about... a small boy with his head in the past. Yes, certainly that, certainly that. Um, the Jewish past, I mean, if we think about that in the same light, um, yeah, the Bible was a beautiful place to be. The Bible was quite different, actually, yeah. from uh, going... Pardon? Adventurous or...? Yes, fantastic. Ripping yeah. yarns. Yes, absolutely. And I, I certainly, my head swam with visions of Jezebel and, and Bathsheba and the Queen of... She uh, that seemed to be fantastic stuff, but totally unlike the rather um, much more dour stuff one got through and one actually went... Sure, when he went to Cheda, when he went to Hebrew classes, yeah. far too much time, in my view, was spent going through the liturgy, the prayer book, which was sort of incredibly boring, which is sort of re re repeated eulogies to the wisdom of the Almighty, and far too little time amidst the stories, which I deeply wanted to do. There was also a, an attempt to do a kind of baby version of what um, Talmud school will do, in other words, you know, brood on whether or not locusts were kosher or not, or why they were mm -hmm. kosher in, in Leviticus, but not kosher in Deuteronomy. This was absolute nightmare, called pill-pull, hair-splitting. The fine, um, one would now say Aristotelian kind of, you know, training of minute discussions, discussion of minutiae, this drove me absolutely crazy. Now, I wanted to be off in Naboth's vineyard and witness to an improbable, to the Battle of Ai, um, or there with Gideon. That was fantastic stuff. Um, and wondering exactly, you know, what, you know, uh, uh, being completely failed to convince that really, um, you know, um, uh, the woman whose thighs were like towers and who's, you know, in the Song of Songs was really a metaphor for um, God's marriage with his people, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it seemed to me about something else completely, something I was much more interested in, sex. <laughs> so that was beautiful. The Bible was beautiful, exactly in the same way I found um, European history beautiful, yes. An escape. Yes. Um, Fleeing into another world. Like well, many of the participants in this certainly, did, yeah, did. Yeah, cer certainly, yes, probably. I mean, it was... Escaping it was, everyday reality, well, you know, uh, the it was, it was, brutality uh, of life. Uh, yes, Being into yes, another world yes, of dreams, the, history, right. ordering. Right, but it actually seemed to me, I think the reason why I demur a bit at the idea of escape is that escape presupposes, um, you know, um, a package holiday. I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are the advertising newspapers, a weekend escape, so that uh, some, the equivalent of a kind of taxi cab would pick you up or an airplane and off you'd go and you'd be on, you'd be on the imaginative equivalent of a beach yeah. somewhere. Not like that. I always thought, actually, that um, it was more a case of an alternative adventure, to use your word a minute ago, which is right. And there were kind of risks and bewilderment and dangers when one, I mean, obviously there weren't any in that sense. <laughs> Um, physically, although one did tend to play on uh, the derelict sites of bombed out buildings. We were constantly, me and my friends, being pulled away from there by policemen, actually, mm -hmm. in, the, in the early 1950s. There were exploded bombs, you know, didn't care about that. Uh, but that's a trivial thing. Um, so I always, I always saw it as a kind of setting out into a different world, really, rather than you know, rather than just a kind of um, uh, a place to which one was um, easily taken. I don't know if that makes sense as, as a difference. I did think there was some effort and imaginative act to be, to yeah, be yeah. undertaken right, in the, the exploration. The metaphor of art, of transformation. Yes. You have to yeah. transform yes, reality in order to be able to live right, with it. Right. Is this a code word? I don't say history or mm. being a historian. Transformation, the necessity to transform mm. every day's life to something else, mm. being able to live with it. Um, Was it that strong? Well, necessity, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the um, 
the oddness of that word. I, um, no, it's luxury in a way. I mean, well, no, that's 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 e that's that's equally perverse actually to use that word. Um, let me let me backtrack there. Um, maybe your word is actually much more pertinent now. I reflect on it for a second. Um, history does seem to me uh, of necessity as. Um, um, There's something incredibly impoverished and narrow and myopic and dangerous about living inside the contemporary, it seems to me, actually. Um, to, to live one's life entirely within the contemporary um, seems an act of sort of dangerous intolerance, in a way, of um, the experience of the past whose heirs we self-evidently are. So, in some sense, um, Cicero was correct, I believe, when he said that to uh, have no knowledge or understanding but to no wish to understand the past restricts one to the mental life of a small child, a small, really small child, mm -hmm. an infant actually, who uh, has no understanding or needs no understanding of where we've come from and therefore has no understanding of whither we go. Mm -hmm. And so I think history is an act of redress, that's the word I was looking for, redress, um, uh, against the uh, perilous narrowness of living with contemporary. Um, and it instructs one, actually, um, uh, it, it, it obliges one to make the effort to really encounter and encompass and live with previous experience. Um, in that sense, it's always an, uh, an issue of reaching towards others' experience, experience of other cultures, experience of other times, other places. Um, breadth um, and a kind of broad um, working understanding of what the human condition is, of what kind of animal we are and what kind of world we inhabit does seem to me to be extremely important. In that sense, you're right about the necessity of transformation. I, I, I guess I would rather use the word of um, liberating ourselves from the tyranny of the present, really. The tyranny of the present. Yeah. Past is an illumination of the human condition, of the same kind that poetry will provide if mm -hmm. it's done well. Not of the kind, in my view, that, well, the way I work with the past, that's what I'm after, if it's a personal question. It seems to me perfectly legitimate for historians to wish the past to yield truths which are more comparable to the truths um, yielded by political science uh -huh. or economics. That's not what I do. Um, so very often, the uh, illuminations I'm hunting down or trying to find are the product indeed of contingency and inadvertence and unexpected connections, really, as in the case of the strategy. Are you deliberately looking for the unexpected? You know, um, no, I mean, but I'm working hard. No, you can't, because, I mean, how would you do that? Yeah, but it's I, impossible. I, it's yeah. impossible. So what you do is you go for as total immersion as you possibly can. And you, with the optimistic conviction, which has not quite failed me yet, um, that you will be guided by a, a, a little epiphany, by an illumination, really. Um, for example, shall I give you an example to make it more sensible? Um, I was, we were just in the, in the series of um, programs we're making on, on British history. Um, I, I was wondering how to deal with Queen Elizabeth, we're back to her again, the first, mm -hmm. and her relationship with Mary Queen of Scots, troubled, tragic, very important story to tell. And um, we were looking for locations and things of that kind, and um, a little piece of paper came across my desk saying, did you know that Westminster Abbey Museum has Queen Elizabeth's underwear? Um, in other words, the underthings that were taken from her when she died in 1603, um, her bodice and her drawers, um, and uh, her chemise, you know, her under petticoat, really. Um, and they'd, her body was taken away and embalmed, of course, very quickly, and the clothes, too, were kept, I'm not quite sure how, uh -huh. in a state of almost airtight preservation. It was an absolutely miraculous accident. And they would then have been kept under glass now, deposited on top of a kind of very crude wooden mannequin, really, a 
sir, but kind of pop eyes and arms, wooden arms scarfed. Um, and I, it, the sense that it was very startling to be kind of confronted with these very beautiful and touching and kind of poignant objects. And the objects, when you, when you look at them, what you see is that the body is long and slim. It's the body of a, you know, almost of a woman who has actually, whose shape has really never changed from the age she was sort of 18 or something uh, because uh, she was a virgin, she was chaste, she you know, never had children, never suckled babies, I mean, never lived that complete. She decided that her biology was to be at the service of her country, her mm -hmm. body had become the country. And I thought, that's what we do. We do, Mary Queen of Scots, the cousin, delivers her body to three equally hideous and unsuccessful nightmarish men you know, and the film will be called The Body Politic and it'll be really about the decisions. That, so it, I, I mean, um, in a sense one was in search of that kind of, that is a form of ordering for sure, but it's not, it's a different kind of um, um, openness to um, s the suggestion of the past really, of what is left of the past, from marching up to a subject and saying, um, for example, um, was the standard of living rising or falling in Elizabethan England? It's very important that people do no, that. I'm just underwear. not very. Pardon? Yeah. Her underwear. Yes, that, yes, yeah, something I had not again meant to look for, like our uh, scene at Juby. I found that very beautiful. I did find that very unbearably beautiful, actually, and poignant. The threads of the thing, I mean, actually, the physical nature of the object over which. I'm glad to say our camera travels very beautifully, the stitching, the sense actually which someone had to untake this off her body. Moving. The body which she... Moving. Very moving, very moving, because I think Why? she knew... Exactly. Well, it seemed to me absolutely to say, which... I know to have been her regret, I can't tell you how I know that, because she would uttered nothing um, of this sort, but um, she had made herself the case for the monarchy, a new kind of monarchy. In other words, she had said, I will have no bridegroom but my country. And at certain points, there had been a true sense of almost kind of physical love, really, between the people she was supposed to be governing and her, her own self. So that when rather belatedly, she was almost 40, she decided maybe she would get married after all. There was the, the indignation of jilted love, a ferocious um, upset and um, really um, deep hurt annoyance, actually. Um, and she abandoned the idea as completely Im impossible. So uh, I was going to say that she'd, she'd actually created the case for a very weird kind of monarchy. And by doing that, she'd made herself literally unreproducible, you know, so that there was a kind of built-in self-destruction in her success. Um, and I must say, I did indeed reflect on that, 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 that what she decided to do with her body was a pyrrhic victory. It was a very important victory to fight, but it had had no issue. And her awful rival, her, co her cousin, uh, I mean, not awful rival, I mean, Mary Queen of Scots, had had issue. Yeah. And the issue was about to succeed when, the, when that underwear was put away. James I, you know, and the Sixth of Scotland would arrive. Uh, and the notion of a popular monarchy was gone. You know, it was gone. So, I mean, actually, that did sort of arise, about the, you know, um, the sense of a kind of fragile object, of um, the delicacy of these objects actually did somehow suggest to me the fragility of what she had wrought in, in her own life. Um, What's the nature of this kind of aha erlebnis? That you find unexpected order? Or that meaning, simply meaning, I'd say. No, meaning. It was there, but nobody yes. noted it. That's no. right, yes, that. And the, the latter, first one the to latter. notice. But it's oh, may there. It probably not the first, but, I don't but make certainly, it up, but not. There. But, yes, oh no, absolutely not invented. Yeah. No, if one actually, I mean, if for example, I'd written into the script or into the book, you know, 
um, a kind of an imaginary soliloquy that she might have had mm. while lying, dying, that would be preposterous. That would actually undermine the integrity of one's own interpretation, I think, or the purchase it might have on people's credibility. No, it becomes a way, actually, of, um, uh, of, of interpreting what she did do and what she did say and what the problems were in, in, you know, uh, in what she had done. So At the same time, it's a halfway station, like it, you said, between fiction and non-fiction. Um, you have to reinvent. No, I, I, no, I think it is. Um, I would, I would say it's a kind of poetic non-fiction. I would absolutely say it's poetic non non-fiction. Yeah. Have a look at those two photographs. Yes. And please tell me what happened. What kind of pictures are we looking at? What kind of experience were we? It, it, it was uh, well. It was an experience of um, accidental emotion. This was a place in eastern Poland on the border of Lithuania. Um, and I was in search of a particular kind of landscape, mm -hmm. um, a landscape in which my grandparents on my mother's side and my great-grandparents had lived, uh, and from which they'd been uprooted. And mm -hmm. it was unusual in that it was a world in which I hadn't thought of Jews as inhabiting a forest world, a world of timber, rather than the world of the fiddler on the roof, chicken scratched, mm -hmm. shed, shed, um, you know, cow barnyard shtetl. Um, so I was actually in search of um, a lost Jewish world, and I guess I'd sort of prepared myself. Can I put that down? Um, I'd sort of prepared myself for. Um, a kind of visual cuddish, in a way, a piece of land, actually, which spoke of loss and emptiness. And on the way, um, simply driving towards that particular landscape, um, flashing past the car, as I described it in the book, um, saw a cross standing on top of the hill, much as you see it there. and. Um, that took me into an utterly different kind of cultural realm. I mean, the realm not of um, uh, another realm of bereavement, another realm of bereavement, but a Catholic world of um, immortality and rebirth. I mean, it, 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 the cross was wooden yeah. and, and therefore belonged to a very ancient Catholic tradition to do with resurrection. Really, um, not really what you expected. Not what I expected at all. No, no. and it was clear also that this had been quite freshly put there, and in front of it were was a kind of um, avenue of stones. And the, when I, I then stopped the car and we got out, and can, can you read for me the, the end of uh, the first paragraph of uh, Landscape and Memory? Oh, sure. Yeah. Can you do it? Uh, yeah. We found ourselves at the edge of a wheat field, the car's wheels spinning crazily in a deep tractor-tread rut. Bogdan, the driver, gunned the engine savagely, careened through the field to descend again to a metalled path. We got out, and beyond the snarling and the smoke of scorched rubber, there it was, a crumbling greystone wall, attempting to contain an acre or so of trees and long, unmowed grass. Behind the wall, the ground rose in a gentle slope. It was a burial mound. Inside the enclosure, what had looked like grass turned out to be a solid carpet of dandelions, packed so thickly that they formed a rippling deep pile meadow, perhaps a foot and a half tall, catching the light through the trees in dancing speckled patterns. It took a while to see any sign of stones at all, but close to the top of the little hill, one or two stuck out from the undergrowth at crazy angles. Was this all? Were these the generations of Jewish Punsk? Had the Nazis ripped out the stones as they had throughout Poland, or had the Lithuanians done it themselves? It was only by crushing the dandelions underfoot that I could feel something other than soft, packed dirt. 
It was, no, it was actually um, clearly a man-made avenue of boulders, but they'd been assembled in a way to suggest that they'd been there over an immemorial amount of time. It was the tradition that was actually being set down. And so we stopped the car and I, I got out and walked to the top of the hill and the boulders then stretched down the other side, but it was this actually that, side. that's the other side and that's the vision which actually, you know, that was the, the um, landscape, the panorama really, which um, greeted me. And that absolutely, I found, um, dumbfounding in a way, because it actually flooded the imagination, both with paintings and poems, and a huge But at the very same time, at the very same moment. Yes. Yeah? Yes, it did, because I'd been, I'd really been reading, um, in translation necessarily, I'd been reading Polish poetry, really, about lost landscapes and um, what they really meant um, the way the way in which a country which had which had been um, forced to disappear Poland at the end of the 18th century had sustained its own possibility of life and resurrection by repeatedly seeing itself um, embedded in a landscape um, and the landscape was constructed of forest and river and rock um, and on all these things somehow, um, a world of politics and a world of institutions and a world of community that had simply been forced to disappear um, by su superior military odds, actually, yeah. other armies, the armies of Russia and Germany that said, we will take you, go away. Um, you know, um, it, it, a country which had been condemned to a kind of annihilation had actually insisted, really, on its own presence through repeatedly, um, from the great 19th century poet Mickiewicz through to Czesław Miłosz in this century, repeatedly imagining it still had a presence in this world. And it was absolutely as though, even though the world I was looking at could not, uh, the, the, the front of it had been designed to trigger that sense of presence in the absence of brutal tragedy. In other words, the stones had been laid down, but someone had seen the rest of the landscape, the river and the forest, as somehow completing this vision, indeed, you know, to speak to your subject, of, of consolation and of being sustained by it. Unexpected and, beauty. Uh, yes, une unexpected beauty, yes, that's right. I think, actually, um, a kind of an unexpected, uh, for me, certainly unexpected beauty, yes. But I think actually it simply reinforced my sense that often the cycles of nature, particularly the kind of woodland cycles or the, the presence of rock in particular, I think, I suppose all the ingredients of this landscape, their life cycle is going to be incomparably more enduring than our own life cycle, or indeed mm. the cycle of nations, that nations rise and fall are here and are gone, communities are here and are gone, in a twinkling of an eye. And uh, ever since na nature has been spoken about poetically, whether in the Bible or in, in classical poetry, in Horace, it, that has been a source of, of, of consolation, I think, to the brevity of our own span on Earth. And I've taken that to be the reason why um, cemeteries have actually been decorated with greenery. Um, I was actually, I recommend to you, Kensal Green, if you're a connoisseur of cemeteries, I don't know if you are, um, I am really. And I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> One at Kensal Green, which I hadn't Sorry. seen, which is most wonderful. It's actually terribly upsetting and poignant because it's really very close to yeah. the place of the Paddington train crash. You actually, you can actually, I hadn't thought of talking about this, but you can actually um, as you wander in Kensal Green, which is, I live in Maida Vale while I'm living in London, um, and so it's really just about a ten minute walk from there, you can actually see the Sainsbury's supermarket from which people rush to the scene of this absolutely horrific train accident we had. Um, and neither my wife and I, we'd actually decided, she's also kind of South Cemeteries, to investigate mm -hmm. this particular one. It's a wonderful, we might have gone there. 
um, a wonderful Victorian cemetery in which the kind of division two of Victorian worthies are buried. Um, the man who thought he'd found but hadn't really a cure for TB, um, the greatest circus rider of the 19th century, and they have these staggering mausoleums there. But I was very struck by actually how many of the, the, the early 20th century tombs have actually been planted with roses. And I don't know about you, I think it's also true of Honham. We've had a very warm summer and very warm mm -hmm. autumn. So these roses are in spectacular bloom, actually. Very English. I don't think that would ever happen in, in America, and maybe not in Honham. But very English, actually, to um, not just bring flowers, but actually plant a rose in the soil in which someone was buried. And that's just sort of, you know, another variant on the notion that actually death can be consoled and compensated for by a sense of... Um, yes, of what? Oh, the sense of the return of nature, that actually in some ways, um, you know, the, the, the fertilization of the future by the remains of the past. It's a fantasy, really. It's a consolatory fantasy. I was going to say that this, this is a fantasy which was um, deeply troubling for the tradition in which I was brought up, you know, the Jewish tradition, um, which is flinty about death, yeah. not, not vernal uh, in any way. Um, and if you want to see a cemetery which resists the beauty of nature as consolation, um, go to the Mount of Olives, you know, really, even though, you know, a beautiful landscape, but essentially each of those tombs in a, in a truly orthodox cemetery will just have a scattering of snow stones. I expect you know it's forbidden, no, really. No, it's just... No, it's forbidden to bring flowers yeah. to a, an orthodox Jewish burial. Yeah. The idea is not that grave is a place of beauty, but the grave is a place of um, inhospitality, so that when the day of... Um, when the Messiah comes and the tombs will be opened, the righteous will be in an extreme hurry to leave this rather bleak waiting room to paradise. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful yeah. trope. Meanwhile, yeah. <laughs> so this, this, this resting place is indeed very stark, meant to be very stark. We'll, we'll come to uh, the Messiah later on, if you don't mind. Well, he can wait, or she. Well, it, it is a she. It's a she, right, yeah. right. This man. We agree? You absolutely, yes. Yeah, we're sure. Seems, yes, I think we're no, without question, I think. Yeah. If he exists, it's a she. <laughs> it's a she. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but standing on this, this hill, I'm returning to Poland yes. for a while. I knelt down and parted the stalks and leaves, brushed away the fuzz of their seed balls. Two inches of grizzled stone appeared, the Hebrew lettering virtually obliterated by heavy growths of tawny and mustard-colored lichen. I could just make out a name, Tet, Bet, Yud, Hey, Tevya, Tovya. I sat and swept my arms about in the, an in the dandelions like a child making a snow angel. Another stone appeared and another, digging down a few inches, brought up another up from the netherworld. I could have spent a day with a shovel and shears and exposed an entire world, the subterranean universe of the Jews of Punsk. But to what end? I thought of my father looking stoically out at Hampstead Heath and reverting to cricket metaphors before he died. When you've had your innings, you've had your innings. The tombs themselves were being buried, sliding gently and irrevocably into their companionable mound as a verdant Lithuania rose to reclaim them. The headstones that had been lovingly cut and carved were losing any sign that human hands had wrought them they were becoming a geological layer. I lay down and stared through the branches at the blue beyond, listened to the elms and the poplars, saying an indistinct Kaddish and thought, well, once there was a Lithuania and no Jews, and for that matter, no Christians either. Then there were Jews, and some of them lived about the wood and took it to the rivers and the towns. And now there are no Jews again, and the forest stands there, Perhaps Deutscher was right, I thought. Trees have roots, Jews have legs. So I walked away from the mound at Punsk. There was a peculiar mixture of feeling I felt at the same time um, 
I needed to see these things and touch them and to kind of lie there where I did literally lie on my back with them. Um, at, at the same time, I did feel I was kind of disturbing their peace. It was, it was like, even though I wasn't opening a tomb, it felt like it because it felt as so though there was another covering, this blanket that nature had given it was, uh, as we say in you know, Hebrew Ara Vashalem, may they rest in peace. And I was actually breaking that peace, but I broke it anyway. Why exactly? Um, I, I needed, I, I, at that point... What were you looking for? I wasn't looking for beauty. Beauty wasn't on my mind, although beauty was there in consolation, yes. Surprise? Yes, I was, I was in a state, I, uh, well, I think I'm certainly still in the state of, of yeah, surprise. surprise. No doubt about that, really. I think actually consolation, not quite right. I think a sort of, um, um, I, was in so, I mean, I was in a very agitated state by then, so I needed to some sense, a state of composure. I mean, a sense of reconciliation, which I write about at just the end of it, that I needed to come to terms with the fact that, you know, this was a community that was never coming back. A lot of Jewish history is about return, really, um, particularly return to Palestine. But um, our generation, I'm, I'm, ju I'm just the post-war generation. I was born in 1945, just mm -hmm. as the war was, was coming to an end. Um, and I think there have, been, there have been an enormous number of journeys that our, um, our generation have taken, actually, in order to satisfy themselves in a sort of odd, rather arrogant way, I guess, actually, that there are some places to which there is no return, there is no coming back. And this certainly, I think, really was, was one of them. So at the end, when I tried to tidy up the disturbance I'd made, it yeah. was like actually pulling back the blanket um, and drawing the curtain over that, really, and making a farewell. I mean, fa are farewells acts of consolation? I'm not sure they are. I mean, farewells, I think, are um, farewells which are that definite, are um, acts of resolution to proceed with another chapter of life. And I don't actually think that there can be any meaningful you know, return to that particular world which was sinking into the soil. Jews had not always lived there, as I said in the book. You know, the, This land had always been there, and Jews had come and Jews had gone. What kind of an atmosphere was it? Your own mental atmosphere, the atmosphere of the landscape, this hill. Um, for that afternoon, for that day, for that week when I was traveling through this world, um, the, the, the farewell element of it, the valedictory element of it, certainly um, in the end made a kind of peace possible and made an end to violence, an end to the memory of violence possible. It's or different, you, I think. Yes, yes, yes. How do I imagine? Makes it possible? What do you mean? A feeling of peace? Peace with what? Um, well, Can I, I, there pe be any peace is no peace. Maybe? Peace is um, <sighs> consolation. Goodness. Um, no, yeah, just I think. Just words, I think. I think. I think. Yes. But I don't think they're the same thing. I think actually consolation means. I mean, I think rather like you know. Um, have you seen the producers? You know, Gene Wilder clutching his security blanket, yeah. this little piece of cloth. Um, consolation means something you can have with you for a long time. You can return to. Yeah. for consolation. I know there is no returning. I mean, I, I wouldn't feel consoled if I decided next week to go back to this place at all, actually. Um, that's why I, I meant it, it made a kind of farewell possible. It made a kind of, um, um, you know, a recon reconciliation with an end possible, really. Reconciliation um, with what end? With the end of Jewish life in this particular in world, this particular, yes. Yeah. I don't think that's the same your as consolation. Family. Yes. Part of yourself. Yes. yes, yes, I think that's right. The Messiah. Yes, what about her? Yes. What about her? <laughs> <laughs> you had a, a, an orthodox up, upbringing. Yes, Jewish. I did. I did, yes. Um, what's the current position here about the Messiah, about God? Did we finally um, get rid of him or her? No, not... Are we liberated? Finally. Um, or can't you be liberated? No, I can't quite be liberated. I'm in a state of fretful disbelief, really. 
but uh, but there's this convenient word agnostic really um which is uh, am i confident enough to say there is no such thing no i'm not that confident really um uh, not yet i don't ever think i will be actually because um i'm not completely convinced by um the idea of the universe as a self-perpetuating lump of physical matter, really. I, I, but on the other hand, I don't believe in the argument by design, from design that the wonderfulness of the world, including the land, something in between. At, it's not a design. It's no, not only yes. contingency. It's something yes, in between. And yes. there, the Messiah shows up, not knowing what he's doing, what she is doing, <laughs> stumbling what around. The, Actually, the Messiah, the Messiah then doesn't picture. is not part of my uh, fretfulness. Actually, it's a, yeah. the fretfulness is about some sort of, I guess, um, again. <laughs> And it's monetary to play to so, some sort of idea, some sort of actually, not idea is much too strong, even though that's the Greek word. Um, but it, I, I certainly um, am not prepared to really um, um, rule out, turn my back on the notion of um, a non randomly. Um, a non-random creation. Um, but the Messiah, Messiah, though, the notion actually that there is um, a presence whose return will be redemptive, um, that seems to me nonsensical, actually. And that, that, um, um, that presupposes a kind of uh, dramatic agenda, you know, um, a sort of play, the script of which um, I don't have any belief in. Messiah showing up uh, Thursday evening uh, at six right. o'clock saying, my God, what did I do? Yeah. Please help me to find the answer. Right. Um, no, I, ju I just... I, no, absolutely not that. No. No. What did your father tell you? What did he you He was die walking of? with you at Hampstead Heath. Yeah. Well, no, he was in bed. Well, he, we did walk a lot, but he yeah. didn't die. But, oh, but he when he talked about God, you know, what did he tell? Did oh, he, he didn't talk about anything? God at all. He didn't no? talk. No, he got he, when the, we were the in. The word wasn't mentioned. Before no, he prayed in synagogue, but but most of the you went talk. With him? Oh yes, yes, I went to I went to shul as we called it, you know, all the time, every every week actually. But when we talked, we talked of football actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody talked about actually. <laughs> or when I was with my friends, we talked about you know haircuts or Elvis or something, actually. My father's God was really just um, uh, a, a, a dinner table companion. I mean, it wasn't. My mother has a much more serious view of a judgmental God. She, and the, for, that matter, for that reason, I think, she doesn't go to synagogue very much. She's now very old, and her sight is failing, so it's hard for her to do that. But she always had a kind of lonely Yahweh to whom she really um, made overtures and, and who turned his face away from her or had something to say to her. My father didn't have that sort of God at all. He didn't yeah. mind? No. Um, I still go to synagogue in Yom Kippur. That probably is an act of consolation, actually. Because I want to say Kaddish for my father. I do that mm. intermittently. Um, it's a very bad son doing that. Um, but um, there were moments, it's quite true, when actually through the medium of prayer, you did feel connected to generations before you, which had gone through very bad things, um, this century and the last century, which brings us back to our landscape moment. Yeah. That I still feel. I, if, I, if there's any reason whatsoever, I do go to, um, to synagogue on, on Yom Kippur. It is indeed to um, reestablish that connection, take oneself out of one's kind of quotidian cultural life, actually, and re-establish that connection and revisit those memories. Yes, that's certainly true. Including memories of my father, yeah. In shul, trying to remember your father, trying to re-establish a connection yeah. with the past. How right. do you do it? Well, the prayers, I mean, the, prayers let you, the prayers let you do it, because you, um, oddly enough, the, the Kurdish, um, which you, which actually you only say, of course you only say at special moments, but that is actually, 
it, it's famously, do you know the book about Kaddish written by yeah. my friend Leon Weaseltay? Okay, Leon, Leon, one of Leon's um, points is that um, the word death isn't actually mentioned in, in yeah. prayer. It's extraordinary, extraordinary for that reason. Um, but it's a formula of sanctification and magnification. Um, um, and um, it's an amazing piece, actually, of um, perhaps therapeutic application of, of Jewish guilt um, in that, of course, one's parent is supposed to, was supposed to have lingered in a kind of uh, Jewish version of purgatory until acquitted by the son. And I don't believe in any of that somehow, but it's, it's quite true that there is a residual sense of obligation not of acquitting my father, who'd done nothing for which he needed to be acquitted, in, in my view, but certainly a kind of obligation against oblivion, against forgetfulness, really. to which I've been drawn has always been um, the beauty of imperfection, really. When, when the classical columns become scarred and pitted and overgrown, the beauty of ruins, really, that has always stirred something more profound in me, I must say, than, than in the intact quality of um, a perfect, Greek bust, a perfect face, a, per a perfect body. That actually, I've never found a source of consolation. Um, and I've actually always found more consolation in mess, actually, in imperfection. De man tegenover me houdt van de Fidelio ouverture van Beethoven. De man tegenover me heeft een niet onaardig gezicht. Maar dat vond hij ooit zelf niet. Destijds, op het schoolplein. Was je tevreden met je uiterlijk in die tijd? Vraag ik in een draaipauze. Shama trekt aan zijn oren. Deze dingen, zie je die? Niet echt ware schoonheid. Jouw definitie van schoonheid nu, heeft die daar misschien mee te maken? Vraag ik. Shama's antwoord maakt, als de camera weer loopt, de vraag minder belachelijk dan hij even leek. Yes, no, absolutely. I was called dumb back. Because um, you were talking about the, uh, the, the ears, the ears, probably. imperfection as a source of beauty. Yes, that's right. Goodness. Well, oh, well there you are. Yeah, so it was really a, a piece of self protection, I guess, because I thought I was extremely ugly as a child. It was mostly because, actually, I had these jug ears, um, and I still do, as I was saying to you off camera, but, but the head has grown in to fill the space a bit, but they were tremendously more, it seemed to me, and I was called Dumbo at school, which is what all poor boys you know had that problem, actually, was were called. And um, so as, you know, puberty happened, um, I, it never occurred to me to really. Um, I thought. I thought. You know. It, it, I, I, the, the terror of rejection by the beautiful, you know, was tremendously strong. The schoolyard in your family. What? Where? Sorry. At the schoolyard. No, the, the terror of rejection by beauty. Girls. Yeah, girls. Absolutely. The girls. Oh yeah, girls. Yes, exactly. My ears. Oh my god. Yeah, my ears, oh my god. Exa that's exactly right. Exa exactly right. But yes. Yeah, so, in fact. Absolutely, there was a conscious aim, um, you know, I mean, I was trying to find um, not girls who, who, were, who were, you know, clearly unattractive, that wouldn't have worked either, actually. But, but one was on trying to find one's side? level. Yes, I would actually err on a safe side. It's absolutely true. Uh, and it was 
much later, I think, and I found that the ears were not quite so much of a problem as I, and that girls really didn't really care about ears one way or the other, as other body parts, or the toot, the whole person, really, and some. Then there was something about the whole person which, which was all right, and I could sort of forget about the ears. When we were really aware of the fact that beauty has something to do with imperfection, was this really at a schoolyard, looking at the girls, thinking, oh, my ears. <laughs> um, no. Um. Rather looking for contingency than ordering. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think actually, um, looking at, um, burnt out buildings, you know, that would, had become overgrown, because that was very early on, and I do remember thinking um, that they that the word that was used by the grown up world was eyesores, actually. And that we're well, back to where we started, that actually as they were being overgrown with wildflowers, a particular kind of wildflower in the city, convolvulus bindweed, which again is a weed but has these beautiful, delicate, rather trumpet lying flowers as it snakes around stone. Um, but these were indeed things of, of um, beauty, and they, they obviously, for everybody else, triggered memories of the horror of bombs and the blitz and so on. And uh, that um, I had no idea what the buildings had been like, but actually that the kind of scars and ruins and debris actually itself had been made beautiful somehow by, by the work of nature. Um, and that, yes, I did find, uh, it was this question of juxtaposition. I do also remember the same bindweed. On a walk I used to take, in, when I lived in Essex as a child, to the lo local town, took one past um, a railway bridge and, um, and iron railings alongside of the railway track. And, um, yes, here we go back to uh, the earlier subject. On the railway bridge was, uh, the phantom lettering of the letters P, J, had no idea what this meant. Um, and along the railway railings, as one went, were these delicate white bindweeds clinging to the track, and uh, to clinging to the railings beside the railway track. And um, I went back home and, f and said to, I can't remember if it was my mother or father, what is P, J? And, um, and I thought it was something to do with PLJ, which was a drink that we used to have, which stood for pure lemon juice. <laughs> I thought the L was missing, but it wasn't. What it said was perish Judah. It was uh, a sign that had been put there by the fascist movement in the war, um, pathetically, it, you know, tiny number in this little Essex town, but enough anyway to actually inscribe those letters on this railway bridge, and for it somehow not quite to have been properly scrubbed out. Um, at which point that particular place did indeed begin to haunt me and fill me full, actually, of childhood terrors, and what if I'd just been a bit older, and what if I'd been a little boy in Germany or in Poland or in, you know, where my grandparents lived. Um, and that actually, I think, really um, very much is in the manner that would come back to me in when I was at GB. Um, uh, the actual irresistible quality of these flowers following on the railway track did indeed seem to me to be um, cheering, if not consoling, comforting, I guess. Comfort and consolation are pretty close together. Yes. Um, yeah. And, th you know, the, 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 the scabby slightly rusted out iron railings and the flowers winding themselves out. God knows that's, I think, a very imperfect form of, of beauty, really. I did then actually think, I must say, to go back to the more important subject of girls, um, there was a point, I think, not just because I was the ear problem, um, but I did start, you know, when I was thinking, do I dare simply ask that girl? You wouldn't ask the great impossible blonde for a dance. But the slightly sadder looking one to the left. Oh, I can give you a great example of imperfection. <laughs> a great example. But let me, let me do this thought first. I did, you, you did start to look at these girls and you thought, God, she really does have beautiful hair. 
actually, even though nose is a bit too big. You forgot about the rest, but uh, yeah, uh, but actually, it was it was it was sincere. I thought, God, you suddenly began to look. If you're if you're like thirteen, you know, twelve rather, you're looking at breasts mostly. Actually, yeah. certainly I was, you know, and 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 legs maybe, uh, 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 you know, definitely seriously second on the order of priorities. Mostly breasts. <laughs> Mysterious and wonderful things. But you weren't really looking at hair or neck or skin. But I did, actually, in that case. And these did suddenly strike me as beautiful and desirable. <laughs> because now, the, the tits were asparagus. Yes, well, exactly. Not, exa not yes, for you. Yeah, not for me. Not no, for you. Exactly, no. Flat-chested but beautiful hair was fine. It was absolutely fine. <laughs> That's exactly right. That was your first deal with beauty. No, the f I tell you the first one in Perfect Beauty because I, I haven't remembered it for a long time until until I was running through that response to your question, and that was um, again I was very I couldn't have been more than ten. Um, uh, a sort of rem distant relative owned a hotel in the south of England called the Normandy Hotel, Jewish hotel, at Bournemouth, very nice place. Um, except for the food, which was even then I hated horribly stodgy kosher Jewish food. And, um, and there were, you know, um, boys who one met and became pals, and then there was the kind of, you know, enticing presence of, of girls, in whom I was starting to be interested at 10, I'm, so there's no question about that. And I'm very clumsy and un uncoordinated. I'm terribly, I'm a sort of, you know, TV crew's a nightmare. I'm always falling over cables and stuff. And um, so at some point, actually, I went into the revolving door in a moment of excitement the wrong way and was knocked completely cold. And when I came to, this is absolutely true, um, I found myself staring at the most beautiful face I'd ever seen. Thick, dark hair, enormous, dark brown eyes. Just a gorgeous young girl's face. But her eyes were slightly crossed. And I assumed it was because I'd been knocked out, you know, and that I would focus, actually. Um, it was and your fault. It, <laughs> and it was my fault, precisely. <laughs> but they weren't. They really were crossed. And she was called Philippa Glicknick. I remember that very well. And years later, I met her, and I, I was completely, in, in, as far as what a 10 did year you old do? child. Just stare at oh, no, no, no. She, she actually touched my fair hair to oh see if God. I was all right. Yes, so it was. You know, moment of, kind of Proustian in pleasure. So it was a moment of the dawning of, kind never of baby desire. Never experienced no, something like no, that again. No, no girl had ever, oh, ever again. No, you're absolutely right. Absolutely okay. right. And I met her again many years, uh, must be about four or five years later, at a dance. And, um, and she was still very beautiful. And, and indeed, she was slightly, it wasn't sort of mad squint, but there was something not right about the eyes. And, and, and you, you, you know, nothing else happened. We had a dance and so on. And, um, and, um, but, uh, uh, but I did again think, yes, she actually always has been beautiful, you know, always will be beautiful, really, despite this. I think that was, the, if there was a moment, really, of, um, <laughs> of awareness about the peculiar coming together of imperfection and beauty, that was probably it. <laughs> Do you still see her? Philippa Glicknick, pardon? Do you still see her? No, 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 no. I mean, last time I saw her, I was, uh, I mean, 10, mm. I was 13. So Do you still remember she touching you? Oh, absolutely. Yes, what absolutely. Kind of I remember when I was absolutely. 16, a girl, she was kissing me here and the yes. neck. Yes, yes. That's An experience very never to be repeated. No, it's exactly right. The first that's tenderness right. and sexuality meeting that's each right. other, yes. never to be repeated. No, I'm sure that's exactly kind, right. Same kind of experience? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, really, no. Um, and it, it didn't educate in one, in any particular way, really, about what one was supposed to do with early sex, actually. Um, uh, the, you know, I guess I, I, I never, never forgot that, but it, but it was no help when you had to learn about kissing. Kissing seems to me, if you had a guy, I mean, it was no problem, any, any kid growing up and watching movies now, actually, it's probably, probably no guidance for kissing now, because it's all fucking, you know, almost no kissing. Yeah which is probably also a problem. We had the opposite problem, namely, it was only kissing, but it was a kissing, mouths were never opened and lips were never soft. So I assumed, oh, what did you do when you kiss? You pressed as hard as you possibly, exactly, Clint. exactly, exactly. And that, and something really amazing was supposed to happen. <laughs> you so did it was, you, clenched, you couldn't just, open your just mouth. Just 
You got it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I did, you know, until again a girl instructed me that no, that's not actually what happens. And that was almost comparable, really. A girl of very imperfect beauty called Susan. Um, uh, that another stage on, very imperfect beauty, actually, but a wonderfully desirable, sexy girl, you know, fantastic girl, really. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> well, that brings us to uh, beauty and decay. Yeah. Germain Creole. That's like, that's like, um, that's like what the Brazilians say about Sao Paulo. You know, is that they go, that Sao Paulo is the only city that's gone from infancy to decay without ever experiencing maturity, actually. <laughs> or the prime of life, you know, so. Yeah, we're talking about decay. I, right. I, I quote Jumaine Creer. She wrote last week. Yeah. Beauty must end, and mm. soon, if it is to be perceived by earthlings as beautiful. A flower that does not fade is hideous. A song that runs through our mind for an hour, let alone for a day or a week, bores and irritates and finally disgusts us. Mm. The keenest pleasure, if prolonged, must turn to pain. Every poet who ever wrote has known that joyous hand is forever at his lips bidding adieu, as Keats said. Yes, that I do disagree this with. This feeling of... Parting. Parting. Yeah, the, the inevitability of parting, yes, of loss. I, I believe that to be true. Yes. Uh, there is a direct connection. Yes, it I is, think that's It is true. almost a precondition for beauty, for the experience yes, of yes. beauty. Yes, I, yes, I, th I don't disagree with that, actually. Yes, yes. I think beauty and sorrow are very close to each other. Yeah. Because? Yes, I think the, um, the impossibility of possession um, is a condition of beauty. Yes, that's, that's right, I think, actually. That's why I have such problems I wonder if Germain does possession? with classical what do you mean? beauty. Um, because, actually, um, you know, the fugitive nature, because the flower will fade, the body collapses, yeah. life goes. Um, and so possession is an illusion, really. It's a temporary thing. I mean, carpe diem, enjoy it, mm -hmm. uh, revel in it, you know, at each moment of it, I think. That absolutely is important. Um, Oh boy, I was going to say something else. Doesn't matter, but I can't remember what it was. Um, before we were talking about possession. Never mind. Yes, but that I think that I think is is um, um, ab uh, absolutely the case. I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, I know what it was. Yes, that actually the the thing about the endurance of marble, the classical idea of beauty, yeah. is absolutely something which is non-decaying, which is. I, I was going to say, I wonder if Germain felt that about the classical tradition, about those Elgin marbles. That's why maybe I'm happy to see this possibility of them going back to their corrupted site on the, on the Parthenon, which uh, the Acropolis, which has not remained the same. Um, but the kind of the icy permanence, the kind of promise of the pristine, really, um, is something really which, which um, is a chill sort of beauty, if indeed a beauty at all. I think, actually. And that pr may be the kind of alienating effect of the exquisiteness of the classical tradition. If one thinks, actually, about the greatest translators of the classical tradition into paint, for me, they have worked best, Titian, when, actually, um, intimations of softness and decay have been present, as they are in the way Titian paints flesh. And, indeed, Late Titian is profoundly, almost unbearably moving because he's invented a broken surface, which of, of the actual paint strokes are broken and feathery, as if in some process, actually, of decomposition. He decomposes Titian yeah. as much as he composes. I think that's profoundly, that does Rembrandt. <laughs> What are the circumstances in your own life 
where consolation was not any good. No music, no art. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the death Can of France. Yes, more. the death of France, yes. Um, I don't mind. I mean, I had a friend um, who, I was an under who I was at college with, a um, very good person. Um, he was a student, and um, we'd spent an enormous amount of time together. And he was, um, he was, he was a mathematician at college, and um, he found, I remember, in great distress that he somehow had been a terrific mathematician, but he'd hit a brick wall. He'd found a level of mathematics that he was supposed to be competent in, and he wasn't, and he went into a terrible spiral of despair. And he came out of it by actually changing subjects and going to history instead. <laughs> Not on my suggestion, but he was a wonderful linguist too. And um, he did a PhD. He was from, he was an only child from a very simple East End Jewish family. Um, and they doted on him and his parents were very simple. They were of kind of one stage back in the journey out of the Jewish East End of London, the towards suburban middle class, one stage further back than my, at least one stage further back than my parents had made. So I was very, I mean, his parents were very much like people I went to see in, in, the, in the East End still. And I was very, his name was John, his name is not to give it. He was a um, fine person, very funny, very soft hearted. And he became, um, uh, after he finished his PhD, he went into the Foreign Office and um, became a great, Chinese speaker and interpreter and actually became, um, I think it was first commercial secretary when Britain opened its first embassy in Beijing. And then he got brain cancer. And um, he was 35, 34, something like that. And he had two small children, wife. Three, ch actually with one on the way. Um, yeah, he had three children before he died. Um, and uh, every time I saw him, he, um, he'd lost his short-term memory completely and was sort of reduced to repeating meaningless things, I mean, asking for a cigarette or something like that. And I did, I, watching him die, really, um, yeah, there was nothing. I remember trying to listen to Beethoven quartets, um, you know, it, was, it seemed to me ridiculous. All it did was really kind of, um, it, 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 it deepened the sorrow a little bit, but... Um, it was not a consolation. It was not a, a consolation. I felt yes, yeah, it deepened it. And I suppose an element really in one's anger and despair. You want to hit bottom somehow. You want to really find that there's some hideous place at the bottom of the pit you know, from which you're going to rise. But we never kind of did really. And the event just happened. The event just happened. And um, one went to see the family lost, and then um, you know life moved on. Really, I felt just terrible for his parents, who were obviously inconsolable, because he had been their posterity. He'd been the reason for their existence. He'd been their consolation for coming, you know, moving towards the end of their life. So there was no consolation for that, and certainly no beauty. But you tried. I'm sorry. You tried. Yes, I to did. To find some consolation. Yes, I did. Beethoven failed to find it. Yes. And it deepened your sorrow. Yes. Instead of. Yes. That's right. In, instead of dispersing it in some yeah. way, making it more bearable because more abstract. No, it didn't do that at all. <laughs> yeah, maybe Beethoven was the wrong. <laughs> was actually the wrong. I don't know who was you know choice of consolatory composer would be. I don't know. There is no consolation to be had in the fact of. A cruel death. I mean, I have a colleague right now, who I won't name, who, at the height of her powers, um, had an aneurysm and then a stroke, and is. Uh, we hope we'll recover, but has, but has succumbed to horrible calamity, really. And I find no. I, there, 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 I find no way to have consolation. Um, uh, were which I hope to God not, hope to something not, if she doesn't die. I've been, been very fortunate. I mean, I will rejoice over having known her and admiring her and having taken, you know, having lived in a world of ideas with her. But it won't be a consolation, really. Nothing can be. No. No music, no poetry, 
no art. It depends on. In the, the end, it's uh, no, not sufficient I, at it, all. That's right. Yeah, I don't think so. No, I don't believe so. <laughs> Consolation is um, something I chew my lip about, so I just did. Exhilaration and kind of resolution, a sort of sense of, I suppose that's a consolation, a sense of actually the pulse beating faster and the blood and, and a sense of celebration, actually, of life. That it sure does. When I'm really, really feeling, I mean, the alternative to coming to see you today would have been to turn on Fidelio very loud. The overture always does it for me, actually. Um, I always think of that as a fist brandished in the face of life's adversities. I love that piece of music. Um, and all sorts of music that I like very much, actually, has that quality of, um, uh, God, almost pugilistic energy. I mean, it has a quality of really, of, um, elated, um, elated vitality. Um, I, music is incredibly beautiful. It's music born of despair and sorrow and tragedy, or not necessarily born of it, but music that really evokes it. But uh, as I said to you when we were talking about my dying friend, uh, when it works most effectively for me, it actually um, deepens the sense of those difficult tempers, those difficult moods. One is drawn to it, as I said, to see how deep it can get, really. Schubert Quintet is always the... the Unbearable. The, the, yeah. At a funeral, for instance. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Terrible to the funeral. Brahms, cello trio, also, I think, really absolutely awful. Um, but you know that adagio in the Schubert Quintet is followed, followed by, it's the, set, the adagio is a second movement, it's followed by the presto. The scherzo is a presto with an andante middle. And a presto is rather like the, the Fidelio Overture. It's full of a triumphant things one never thinks about in terms of Schubert, but one damn well should. Schubert's full of heroic strength, and that surging presto is just one of the most amazing, I mean, invigorating is ridiculous, sounds like a kind of medicine, but um, it, 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 it's full of the celebration of life and of energy and of a kind of heroic um, um, vitality, really, which is, which is um, I mean, I, I, I go to music for that. I go to music for that. Really. But finally, it deepens. Tragic music deep, deepens and therefore offers no exit and no consolation and no hope, I wouldn't say. Only a sort of sense of pathetic, limp gratitude that there have actually been people vaguely resembling one's own species that have actually been capable of producing it. That is a sort of a consolation. Somebody's birthday today. It's not never, no. Oh, uh, they're killing somebody. Yeah, I wonder what it is. The end of Rehearsing. The oh, you know what they're doing? Um, um, Zhang Zemin or someone is in town. Who? So the Chinese Prime Minister. Oh. Um, so actually, I don't think they're killing him, but they're, they're showing him how to kill others, maybe in a very old-fashioned way. All those pigeons behind you. It's wonderful. Absolutely, oh, that's very good. <laughs> they're panicking. It is. Yes. Look you at see? That. Yes. Look at that. Just, just the other side. The Chinese the are coming. <laughs> <That's right>. Beware. <laughs> 
absolutely I don't know what to do. The rats of the air, finally. <laughs> and they're going around in circles. So yeah, that, that really helps. That's just what we do, isn't it, really? <laughs> Fly around in circles. Yes. Consolation, beauty <laughs> consolation, beauty <laughs> consolation, beauty <laughs> consolation. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, Are you ever tempted again. to change the subject? <laughs> uh, I, I changed the subject a little bit. Yes. Uh, Stephen Weinberg, one of yeah. your fellow participants, yeah. says there is no consolation talking about our role in this universe, mm. except maybe a tiny bit if you dare to accept that fact. We talked about the Messiah. Yeah. So simply right. accept the fact that there is no consolation and then oh, accepting I see. Oh, I see. there may be oh, I see. a little bit of a consolation. Um, no, I find that absurd, actually. Um, Why? Um, I just, I don't think it's a necessary it's condition of discovering work, consolation. Yeah. Yes. I think it's actually, it's too paradoxical for its own good, actually. Um, I think actually the finality of accepting the non-existence of consolation um, disproves its own meaning, really. I mean, I, I, I see that not as an interesting paradox, but as a non sequitur or a contradiction in terms. Yeah. Sorry, Steve, but you know, he, I'm sure he should be here, really. And I don't, for me, I don't, I don't find the. Um, I, I was saying there is no consolation in anything for acts of great cruelty, no consolation for, you know, um, for Auschwitz. That, that's right. But is there any consolation in contemplating the human condition and the natural world um, in a larger view, which says it's part of the human condition to experience cruelty and tragedy? Absolutely. Absolutely, in the color and creativity um, and uh, energy, um, uh, I, I, it, it, it's an, to me, it, it, there's an enormous degree, actually, of um, consoling substance, really, um, in the kind of animal energy of the world, in the you know the natural beauty of the world, really, for um, for taking on board the truism that a great deal of our history and our human existence is has been and will continue to be um, uh, marred by dreadful tragedy, dreadful tragedy. That's different, I think. I find it very myopic, actually, to to. Um, to say that, or, or, or very um, misanthropic, I guess. It's like Timon's position in the Shakespeare play, really, that, um, well, or, or, or let's say in, in the sense of um, a consolation prize in England. Yeah. Have you discussed that? You know, is a prize mm -hmm. for not winning something. Yeah. Right. And that's the sense in that's which I see Stephen Weinberg. Yeah. Well, as Jerry Seinfeld says, who wants to be top loser? You know, just yeah. so he says he's not interested in, in the silver medal, really, because that makes you top loser. Um, <laughs> and that's, I guess, Steve Weinberg's notion that, that it's a kind of uh, a, a loser's delusion, really, that you can sort of comfort yourself with a delusion that there is something worth cherishing in, in the world. Um, once you've realized it is just a shallow delusion. I don't buy that at all. Actually, um, in, in, I don't know, you know, the park in the spring and the season, in, in the love of a family, in the sexual act, I mean, God, you know, just a list in great painting. Um, there is um, a kind of um, an intense um, 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 validation of life. It's not the validation of the point of life, about which I absolutely don't presume to have anything to say at all. Um, I haven't figured it out and don't, don't actually spend time uh, I'm preoccupied with it. But the validation of um, the complexity and pleasure and, yes, you know, beauty of the world, really. Um, consolation I would want actually to make uh, a, a a positive and um, it's a strong, not a weak, a strong, not a, not a, not a weak quality. 
But if we're talking about, like Stephen Weinberg is talking about outreach. No, then. There, well, is, well there is no moral God no. after outreach. No. You can't forget about it. I feel a little bit sad about it, but let's forget about it. I think that's true, yes. But for you, this is okay. I've been in Poland, I've seen the stones. Uh, is the word consolation? No, acceptance is the word. Acceptance is the word. I yeah. think, actually, that's what I—the word I think I didn't use when we talked about Poland. I was talking, saying reconciliation, which wasn't quite right, but acceptance. Yeah, that's what I mean. Word yeah, for, for me, actually, the, the acceptance of monstrosity and cruelty, and, and uh, it does not obliterate um, it, it, the the acknowledgement of the strength of beauty, um, you know, and of acts of creativity um, and um, the fertility of the natural world, the kind of miraculous fertility of the natural world. Um, the Third Reich was full of cons natural conservationists, really. It didn't stop them committing genocide, planning genocide, de planning genocide as part of an effort of natural conservation, <laughs> clearing, <laughs> clearing the woods of Jews and eventually of Poles. So, kind of, you know, one is not. Um, um, at all, a kind of um, it, 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 it doesn't work as beauty is too thin and too brittle, really. It, it, it's not a guard against barbarity at, not all. at all. No, 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 I don't think so. No. So, what is it? Um, of either kind, I mean. Um, well, the beauty that leaves me cold, which we've talked a little about, is, as I say, um, a fantasy. It's a sort of sketch of an ideal, really, um, which is essentially um, a kind of fantastic abstraction, the perfect nose, the perfect breast. Um, you know, the, um, or I don't know, you know, um, And, and it, the difficulty I have with that, really, is that it's um, uncoupled, really. When the music of the spheres is that really so remote from the blue planet, from our yeah. own planet, um, I, I just cease to be interested. Um, beauty that's a mirror of our own condition in its stages of decay and with its blots and stains, that, that um, I do find sort of poignant and um, and something which um, deepens our own uh, our own our own sense of self awareness, but actually deepens. Um, our sense of the possibilities of existence. Um, that's to say, to see that curl of hair on the neck on a girl with cross eyes, or to see suddenly a wrinkled face, very uh, of an old person, suddenly as beautiful, actually, um, is a sign of the dawning of you know, uh, tolerance, of compassion, um, of love. Love. Beauty, I think, works when it is actually um, a gateway to love. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Do, do I love the world when I see the spring? The yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, it's, it's, the, the, it's the difference, really, between and love. I take it to be the ability to actually cherish something that is not a mirror, not 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 actually oneself. It is involuntary selflessness. Love. That's a that's a strong quality of it. I mm -hmm. believe. I, I, you know, when you when you when you become a father, a parent, um, you become involuntarily self unselfish. Yeah. I think really. Um, and that is, I think, um, a, a characteristic, uh, perhaps the great characteristic constituent of love. 
um, the, the, the beauty that's the beauty of the Elgin marbles, of, of that of Winkelmann's kind of beauty, of Michelangelo's kind of beauty, is ultimately a kind of complacent form of self-celebration, to imagine yourself related to David, as in the Michelangelo's David, that in you lurks the god. Really, that's totally uninteresting in it to me, actually. And I, don't fi I find that too weak a case for the moral possibilities of beauty or the consolatory possibilities of beauty. Of beauty. Beauty is, as I, as I say, a gateway of love. I, I, I find a much stronger case. But that has to be a beauty We're of not imperfection. We're talking about Rembrandt now. We're well, well about uh, Rembrandt, would, Rembrandt would certainly well, not be excluded from that. Well, it's a kind of sideshow. What yes, we're talking it's a about yes. is your own yes. private circle, yeah, absolutely. your children, yes. no, your wife. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. No, I'm not talking about Rembrandt. He didn't pop into mind there at all. And my mother, you know, yeah. Yeah. So finally, ultimate beauty. Where, or the marriage between beauty and consolation, that's what you're talking about. Yes, yes. It's not so much to do with art, paintings, no. music. No. No, that's quite right. It, it is to do with personal love, yes, I'm sure that's right. With kinship, really. Not as a kind of clannish thing, I don't mean. That's to say that you can find... Um, when I, when I said to you, uh, you asked me, uh, or rather you, you, you said, um, you listed all, all of my colleagues and some of my friends, you know, who, who found no consolation in their particular field of work, and I, I said to you, without you pushing the question, yes, I do find consolation in history, which I do, and if the, the extension of that would be to say, do I find history beautiful? And then, of course, there's unbelievable ugliness in history, but a as a whole, to dwell in the past, is that to dwell amidst much beauty? Yes, it is. And it's because, actually, the element of beauty in history is an intimation of kinship. You feel, I don't feel kinship with, you know, Goering, let's say, um, but it, it, it's a way to feel kinship with the lost, dead, um, with, with all sorts of worlds, you know, that otherwise are simply just so much rubble and so much dust. Um, and I, I, I derive huge sort of consolation from that. So there is a sort of connection, really, between, between that kind of work and between uh, the ultimate beauty, which, as you absolutely rightly say, is returns to personal love. Yeah, love, love one's, one's love for others. Yeah, absolutely. 